Welcome everybody, this is Axel, Axel Merck, President and Chief Investment Officer of Merck Investments. As many of you are aware, the chart books that we generate tend to try to have as consistent a set of data points on different topics. This particular one is on the Fed, we have others on the markets, on interest rates, on the business cycle, and have some special situation chart books, so we're working on some. And uh, Nick is providing his analysis on many of them. You see them in the blue text in the bottom of, of the charts. My goal is to read in between the lines. And that's, as I mentioned on, on a previous occasion and another one of these uh, voiceovers, so to speak, is that my goal is to give a little extra interpretation. And that's very distinct from the goal that Nick has where he's just trying to let the charts speak for themselves. So let me dive into that. It also means that I'm not gonna spend an equal number of time on, on each chart, I'll just point a few things out on here and there. Um, so on this chart, um, it shows in the black line the, the Fed of funds rate, the target rate, and then I think you see this grayish point here where the Federal Reserve estimates the longer run um, federal funds rate to be. Very noteworthy is in the, in the recent Fed March minutes, the Federal Reserve has pointed out that it may be appropriate that the federal funds rate may be above its normal value for a time. So we might be moving above the 3% range. Very much in contrast that as I'm recording this this morning, um, that is a few days before the, the Fed minutes are released, somebody pointed out the economy is going to expand for several more years, but the Federal Reserve is about to plateau out on its rate hikes. I don't think that's compatible. Um, I think that if the economy does indeed expand for several more years, that the federal funds rate is going to move substantially higher. A big reason for that is that I, more so than many in the markets, believe that uh, inflation or pressures are building. But let me hear a comment on, on some of the charts here. Um, expectations of what is being priced in a year from now. And uh, a lot of people have been talking about, are we going to get three rate hikes a year, four rate hikes a year, and by the way, we've had one early in the year, and then on June 13, most people are expecting there's gonna be another rate hike, and that means we would have two already for the year, and a lot of people are saying we're only gonna get three. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't have four rate hikes this year, unless something pretty bad happens in the markets, and with bad, I don't mean the S&P plunging, for example. What we need to see, and we'll look at those charts in a moment, is we need to see the so-called financial conditions deteriorate. Because believe it or not, the Federal Reserve is actually not in the business of, of managing the S&P 500. Um, they are in the business of managing inflation. Now, you should be excused if you got confused over the years um, since the financial crisis. And the reason I, I say that semi-cynically is because Whenever something really bad happened in the immediate aftermath of the financial crisis, um, you had the S&P plunge, but that was associated with financial conditions deteriorating. Now, financial conditions might seem like a, um, a, an, an odd term, but what it basically means is that let banks stop lending. And then if banks, the banks stop lending, the Fed has a problem. And so if that's the same as the S&P doing well or not well, well then yes, sure, you can say the, the Fed is managing the S&P, but we've moved beyond that in the current environment, um, access to credit is very easy. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, inflation, the thing that the Fed is supposed to be watching, inflation readings have been moving higher. The headline inflation here, touching 2%. More importantly, maybe inflation expectations moving above 2% firmly so. Now, in Europe, People look at market-based inflation expectations quite extensively. In the U.S., quite frequently, um, observers and the Federal Reserve as well um, put more emphasis on survey-based inflation expectations. And so those tend to be a tad more sluggish than what you see being priced into the markets. And, and so, but um, I do think it is relevant that the market is pricing in high inflation expectations. And uh, if we move into why that may be the case. Um, the black line is the average hourly earnings. And for a long time, people have said, oh, earnings are not picking up. Well, of late, you see a pickup in earnings. And obviously, as you can see, these, these data points are quite volatile. So any good economist is going to say, oh, let's look at it with hindsight. The market isn't known for being patient and jumps to conclusions. I happen to agree here with the market's assessment that wage pressures are increasing. A lot of people are 
are switching jobs. So a lot of the, the folks taking on new jobs are folks quitting other jobs. Um, and the, the, the relevance here is that if you are kind of joining the, the working world, well, you, and especially if it's out of necessity, you might accept pretty much any wage. Um, but if you have a job, well, you're only going to switch jobs if you're moving up to something better. And maybe the new project is so brilliant that you're going to accept a pay cut, but most people will switch jobs in order to get a, a rate hike. And so when more and more people are switching jobs, then that sort of job growth is, tends to be more inflationary. Um, another measure of inflation here, but let me focus here on the inflationary drive. Um, here there is a snapshot here on the folks who are on the sideline in the labor market, and that has, uh, we, we've had fewer people kind of join the workforce, we had some dip down. I prefer to look at the longer term trend here. Um, this is from the 1950s, and note the previous and this chart focuses on the men only. We do that not to be chauvinist, but because it's a tad more um, specific on, uh, you see more things uh, because there are a lot of other drivers that, that have in the over last several decades driven female labor force participation rates with women joining the workforce and then less so and so forth. But those numbers in my view are more distorted. We obviously see in recent years um, that we've had lot, many people leave the labor force and then recent years, like the last 10 years, but then the last several years as the economy has picked up, many of them have come back to the sideline. I've pointed to this chart as one that I'm watching very closely. Um, and this dotted line, by the way, that, that you see, it's not a very scientific line. We've just put that in here. Um, but it is, to me, one of these points that if we were to breach that, then we may well have reached Kind of the end of the slack in the labor market and the reason i say that is because if history is any guide it might be the point when fewer people will be willing to join the labor force now do i know that for a fact no i don't um but that's my feeling that how the fed might be thinking i uh, look at pressures in, in wages those are increasing and these are all indications that we might be having exhausted kind of the slack in the labor force and what we haven't talked about is we got this economic stimulus Right? So unless um, some trade war is really gonna, gonna ruin this economy um, or some other shock, um, I happen to think these inflationary pressures are gonna increase. And by the way, we don't have it on these charts here, trade is a small portion of the US economy. Um, about 15% of GDP is dependent on trade. And it clearly, if uh, we've seen that in the past, if uh, China has a major problem and has ripple effects. But what I'm talking about here is Fed policy inflationary pressures. And those inflationary pressures are not necessarily going to change because some trade things flying up. Now, clearly, you can make conclusions about inflation based on, on, on trade as well. If you have lots of tariffs, you might get an inflationary push as well. Um, but in the context here of, and, and by the way, let's take a step back. You have a Federal Reserve that's faced with an amazing number of oddballs, right? You've got Trump tweets here happening every day. You don't quite know how um, the, the tax reform is, is going to happen. You've got uh, this happening, that happening. Well, if you're at the Fed, you just have to tune down the volume a little bit and look at the data, right? That's part of the reason we have this chart book, to kind of give you an idea of what the Fed might be looking at. And say, we don't know what the impact is going to be of, of trade. We have our views, and neither does the Fed. But you cannot, if you are the policymaker, you cannot just say, hey, yeah, we go back to zero simply because there might be a trade war breaking out between the US and Canada. It's just not realistic, especially when you have a president that says, I'm playing games and we're going to, and then every five seconds you hear different policy. Right? You cannot set policy based on that if you're at the Fed. And so what you're going to do is you're going to take a deep breath. And he says, all right, let's see where the chips fall. And the, the, the challenge, of course, with that is that monetary policy is considered to be acting with a lag. So if something bad were to happen, well, then it might take nine months for whatever the Fed does to change things to ripple through the economy. And also, let's keep in mind, and we'll talk about that in a second, who is at the Fed right now and how the decision process works. You know, back to the chart at hand, financial conditions, uh, the black line is the rates going up. Financial conditions, according to this index here, that's the, that's the Chicago index, uh, that has actually been easing. And uh, there are different indices that show slightly different pictures. But what happens in an advanced stage of an economic cycle is that banks are eager to lend. And so at the very point of hiking rates is to tighten financial conditions. 
Um, the thing that uh, Yell in the previous Fed show said that hiking rates is like watching paint dry on the wall is complete nonsense in my view. The reason she said it um, is because she didn't want to spook the markets. But now we're at a stage where labor markets are getting tighter, banks are very eager to lend, and the Federal Reserve is hiking rates and saying, listen, we've got to cool this down just a tad so that we don't overheat. And guess what? I happen to think the same thing is going to happen. It happens so often in the economic cycle that at some point, yes, conditions will start to tighten. At that stage, inflationary prices will have increased. That means the Fed will have to continue to raise rates, and that means they'll overdo it. But we are far from that, um, at least as the Fed is concerned. I'm not saying we're necessarily far from the Fed, quote unquote, overdoing it. That might, that's an independent assessment. But this is an assessment about whether rates were going to continue to rise. My view is, and I mentioned that in a recent newsletter, that the Fed is, that not a sufficient number of Fed rate hikes are being priced in. The balance sheet we couldn't, shouldn't ignore entirely. There is a quantitative tightening on the way. Um, it starts out slowly, but then gradually tends to accelerate. And let's keep in mind, that means there is a more bonds available in the market. That's just happening at a time when the, when the government, Treasury, is issuing uh, an increased number of bonds because deficits have been increasing. And so there's going to be more competition um, for bonds. And we see that, uh, the, the one area we see that in the market is the lower end of investment grade corporate bonds. It's a segment that historically people have looked at so much. But the reason that segment of the market appears to be most affected is that it depends on, think about who buys a bond, right? The high yield investor is one who chases yield, who likes to have risk, um, and is willing to accept a higher premium for it, a higher price for it, uh, or demands that for it. Uh, whereas on the investment grade side, people don't necessarily want to take risk. And so if you can buy treasuries at an acceptable rate, why bother taking on the, on the additional risk that, the, the, at the, that you get at the lower end investment rate? And so fewer people want to have them, rates are going up. And so that's one aspect of the market where you see financial conditions deteriorate, doesn't show up in that, that index that we showed earlier. In any case, the quantitative tightening we see um, is going to increase a little bit. And of course, some people are arguing that that's going to take the place of some rate hikes. Um, it remains to be seen. Um, I do think that uh, that thing will, will move on. The one thing that this does is it does have other market implications. Um, we used to, as we I talked about earlier, is there used to be this assessment that, um, that the, the Fed is kind of managing the S&P. Well, as quantitative tightening happens, we've seen correlations break down, these, these notions we've had for several years after the, the, the 2008 crisis, it, it was that there is this exact inverse relationship between bonds and stocks. And ever since last December in particular, I've referred to this market more as a, as a washing machine. The dot plots, here we go. Um, uh, all the economists love talking about the dot plots. They're basically um, in, in folks who are F, on the FOMC, that's the board that decides on interest rates, where they think um, appropriate monetary policy wants to be. And the one thing I like to caution is a lot of talk about this longer term. Well, longer term might also be a fairy tale green number where they would love it to be if everything worked fine. Let's also remember, um, and let me here skip to uh, who is at the Fed, that not everybody is voting at the Fed. You've got governors at the Fed, you've got regional presidents at the Fed. Well, the person who matters most is the chief. Um, and uh, then obviously we got the vice chair who historically doesn't disagree with the Fed. And then you got some governors. Um, note that there are three vacancies at the Fed and they haven't been nominated. And then the, there's one special status, the New York Fed chair who is always voting. The other ones have this rotating system. And what they're mostly known for is that many of them speak on CNBC and the like. And they talk a lot. The question is how relevant they are. In my view, they're very relevant in an intellectual discussion um, to potentially, in the medium to long term, to convince some folks about certain issues and to raise important points. But they historically do not run the policy. It's the chair that runs the policy. And we always have to keep that in mind. Similarly, when somebody grabs the mic, um, you've got to keep in mind whether they're voting or not voting. So these, these plots we saw earlier is, quote unquote, everybody who is at the Fed and uh, several of these folks are not voting. And so they may not be all that relevant. Um, John Williams, this is the, the last meeting, the June meeting, where he's, as a San Francisco Fed chair, he is becoming the New York Fed chair. 
Um, the New York Fed chair is running the, the open markets desk, and, and so they're supposed to have a closer touch to the markets. What's interesting about Williams is that he is the first person in a long time who is an academic and not a markets person. And when it was first announced, I said, hmm, is it so good to have somebody who doesn't have any markets experience to be the, the New York Fed president that has to run the markets desk? And uh, well, some folks at the Fed, or former Fed folks, uh, I'd say former Fed folks have said, um, the folks who were uh, close to the markets were pretty useless during the uh, peak of the financial crisis. So maybe it's good to have somebody with a bigger picture view. So I'll just leave that at that. Um, could be could be interesting. In any case, um, the one thing that can happen is that when you have three vacancies at the governors, and no, governors are historically not known to disagree with the chair, um, it is actually feasible that the governor gets overruled by the by the regional. Uh, president, so that's uh, that's something to keep in mind. Um, beyond that, you have this Dove Hawk scale. Dove, and, and the Fed president and governors don't like those labels because they will always tell you to do the right thing at the right time. But the quote unquote Doves are are set to be more in favor of lower rates. The Hawks are set to be more in favor of of higher rates. Um, to me, the relevant part is that Mr. Powell, the chair, he is a lawyer. Um, he's a smart lawyer. And what that means is that he is he doesn't have an agenda um, as far as monetary policy is concerned. Um, Bernanke had his Great Depression environment. Yellen was a labor economist the, and, and looked at certain things here. Powell is more of an administrator. He gets extremely enthusiastic when you talk about regulatory policy, not so much monetary policy. So he's going to call the smart people. He's going to call the the research staff at the Fed. And basically what that means is that decision making is gonna be slow. Um, and that also goes into my sense here, my framework, that rates are gonna to continue to march higher. Um, and when there's a crisis, um, he's gonna call his committee. And that may or may not be the folks on the FMC, but it's gonna be some trusted people um, in the research um, staff. And by the way, one other thing is the regional Fed presidents all have their own staff. They have their own research. They, they can guide projects, whereas the governors, they don't really. Um, they, they are pretty much on their own. Um, and so they're much dependent on, on, on what the, the chair says. And that's one of the reasons they don't dissent so much. So here, Nick has given his conclusions. I've given mine here uh, as a narrative. Uh, what I would like to just add here, is that um, please um, look at these chart books, give us feedback, and also give feedback whether, whether this particular kind of commentary or reading in between the lines is helpful to you. And uh, let us know what you think about these projects. Let your friends know about this project, um, about having access to these Fed charts. Merckinvestments.com forward slash research is the place to be. And then let me just give a pitch for something else. Um, in uh, early June, we wrote a newsletter on, uh, on why I believe interest rates are too low. And uh, have a look at that, study that if you agree. Again, give me feedback. But also relevant in that is that um, we might be able to help some folks on taking positions on interest rates. And uh, at the end of that newsletter, is a questionnaire if you want to fill that out and uh, let us know whether we can be of service. Anyway, um, that's it for now. Looking forward to touching base with you next time.